Hello, everyone, and on behalf of the museum, welcome. Whether you're joining us live on the live stream or tuning in at a later date and time, thank you for your support and joining us today for our 55 and Better Fridays programming. My name is Caitlin Dietrich, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Special Projects here at the museum. We begin today by acknowledging that we're meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, there have been Indigenous peoples who have been the stewards of this place. In particular, we acknowledge the Neutral, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Today in this moment, I'm also thankful for the changing seasons and happy to see the beginnings of spring as it's a time for renewal and rebirth for the land and the many animals that inhabit the land with us. Thank you. Today's event is in support of our latest exhibition, Dinosaurs, the Age of Big Weird Feathered Things, which will be open to the public beginning Friday, April 9th, 2021. If you are 55 and better, you will receive free admission to the museum every Friday. So if you have any questions or comments during today's event, please feel free to share them in the chat box and we will have time for questions after Nicholas is done speaking. I would also like to thank the Government of Canada for helping to fund this initiative and our programming sponsor, Chartwell Retirement Residences. I wanted to now welcome Amanda Murray from Chartwell Retirement Residences to say a few words and to introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. My name is Amanda Murray and I am coming to you from Uptown Waterloo at Chartwell Terrace on the Square. We are pleased to partner with the museum to bring you today's presentation. Our presenter today is Nicholas Carter, who is the coordinator of education and program at the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum. He's worked at the museum for four years and has had a lifelong obsession with dinosaurs and other branches of natural history. He's also an avid naturalist who loves to learn and share new things about life on earth. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas Carter. Thank you for that. Very nice to be here. Uh, so without further ado, I will oh, just need to be able to share my screen. It says uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. There we go. Good old Zoom. Okay. And here we are. So today we are here to talk about uh, paleontology beyond the badlands. So I'll explain what that means in a little bit. But uh, yeah, so my name's uh, again, Nicholas Carter from the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum. We're kind of uh, Alberta's newest uh, dinosaur museum. Uh, there's a couple others around here. And just a little bit about myself, I uh, studied at the University of Alberta in Edmonton and have, uh, you know, kind of a track record for being really into natural history, nature, paleontology type stuff. And uh, yeah, so I am coming to you from uh, the province of Alberta, way out west. Now, Alberta is obviously renowned as being a very sort of dinosaur centric place. Uh, we have more dinosaur fossils here than just about anywhere else in the world. But most of the uh, dinosaur renowned places in the province come from uh, more down in the southeastern corner. You can see places like uh, the Royal Terrell Museum in the town of Drumheller down uh, along the river there. And then further down the Red Deer River, we have Dinosaur Provincial Park, which is generally regarded as the best place in the world to find dinosaur fossils. Uh, so a lot of research goes on there, as well as at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. So we've been finding dinosaurs in that sort of section of the province for a little over 100 years now. But where the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum is, is way to the northwest in uh, this area that we sort of informally call the Peace Region. And it's just outside the town of Grand Prairie. So we're kind of way out in the middle of our own sort of rustic part of the province. And we have a very interesting geology around here. So to know a thing or two about dinosaurs, it's helpful to know a thing or two about rocks. Uh, 
So down in the southern prairies or out where the badlands are, we have these very well studied and accessible sedimentary rocks, which are the kind of rocks that contain fossils. And like I said, they're quite easy to get to because all you have to do is just journey across the prairie until you find some ancient badlands exposures and go down and have a look. Uh, now these rocks that I'm talking about were laid down during a time that we call the late Cretaceous period, which is near the end of the age of dinosaurs. And up in the northwestern part of the province around us, uh, we have rocks of a very similar or the exact same age that we call the Wapiti formation. So Wapiti is a First Nations word that just means white rump, which is normally attributed to uh, what we also call the elk, uh, but it also is the name for this rock formation. So it's as old as these other uh, dinosaur bearing rocks in the province, but it's a lot harder to study. And so it's often been kind of ignored by paleontologists. It's just kind of a, a harder to get to and uh, our rock exposures up here are sort of fewer and further between. So there's kind of a, a somewhat old but sort of simplified history here of the uh, exploration of the Wapiti Formation. The person on the left is uh, George Dawson, uh, who is nicknamed the Little Doctor because he was uh, short in stature but very big in adventure and intelligence. So he uh, traveled up to northwestern Alberta from uh, his home base in Ottawa and uh, described the Wapiti Formation. And he was a really avid fossil hunter. Uh, he found a few uh, you know, fossils in the area, but nothing really of uh, any importance. But he did a lot of exploring in the sort of northwestern part of the country. And we have a few cities in the area named after him um, in British Columbia and in the Yukon. Uh, the person on the right in front of the Tyrannosaurus skeleton there is Charles Sternberg, and he and his family are a part of the, this uh, you know, really interesting history of fossil hunting in southern Alberta. Uh, Sternberg and his dad and his brothers did a lot of the early exploration and found tons of really famous dinosaurs. Uh, but he traveled up here in the 30s and described some dinosaur tracks from up the Peace River in the mountains of northern BC which would have been a pretty uh, interesting trip at the time. Uh, he also explored our little own isolated patch of badlands that we have up here called the Kluskin Hills. Didn't really find anything noteworthy um, aside from a little lizard skull. But uh, for the most part, the area was ignored by professional paleontologists. Uh, but back during the 1940s and onwards, uh, there was all these... Um, sort of local fossil hunters, these sort of amateur collectors who scoured the area for bones. And unfortunately, a lot of them didn't really keep rigorous track of where they found what they did. Um, so we have uh, lots of people who have, you know, sheds and garages and attics full of dinosaur bones that, uh, you know, they kind of realize are significant, um, but didn't really write down where they found them. Uh, now, professional attention to this area kind of changed when uh, a local resident named Al Lacusta discovered a dinosaur bone bed, which is essentially a big graveyard of dinosaur bones, at uh, this local waterway called Pipestone Creek, which we'll talk a lot more about. And uh, shortly after that, the Royal Terrell Museum in Drumheller was found, which is Canada's biggest paleontology museum. And uh, they came up here and started looking around with the local community college staff and prospected and dug up at uh, Pipestone Creek and realized that there was a lot of potential here. And uh, that work continues to this day, the University of Alberta, as well as my own brand new museum, the Philip J. Curry Museum, uh, you know, looks around the area and uh, finds what we can find. And you can see that picture on the right there. That's what a lot of dinosaur digs look like. Uh, in the Grand Prairie area, you're not out in these dry, arid badlands. It's these sort of rock exposures on these very, very steep slopes in these deep valleys full of brush and trees and uh, very hard to get to. It takes a lot of effort to get down there and then back up at uh, the end of the day. And uh, it's not terribly uncommon to find evidence of or even have sightings of things like bears and moose and, and whatnot. So there's some additional challenges. So here is kind of a layout of the different ages 
of the rocks in Alberta. Now, this looks like a lot of information, but essentially what we're looking at here is in the central and southern plains, you have this unit of rock called the Dinosaur Park Formation exposed in Dinosaur Provincial Park. Here's a picture I took there a few years ago. It was very hazy from all the forest fire smoke coming from the north. And it is full of dinosaurs. Uh, we have many, many different species from there. Now, at that time, Alberta was kind of a, a subtropical swamp on the edge of this inland seaway that ran through the middle of the uh, continent. And uh, just after the dinosaur park era, that seaway expanded to the west and east and covered that area in water so dinosaurs could no longer live there. And the rock that was deposited during that time we called the Bear Paw Formation. And then eventually that seaway receded and uh, southeastern Alberta was once again uh, terrestrial, land-based, and dinosaurs could live there. And the unit of rock laid down during that time is called the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, which you can see exposed around Drumheller. I took this photo just outside the Royal Tyrrell Museum. And the Horseshoe Canyon Formation is also full of dinosaurs. Now they're similar, but slightly different than the dinosaurs we find down in the Dinosaur Park Formation. So while southeastern Alberta was underwater, there was kind of a transitional period that we're missing because uh, dinosaurs couldn't continue to live and evolve in the, the Bear Paw Sea there. Uh, but if we look to the northwest, the Wapiti Formation spans that entire time and it's completely land-based. So this was a place where dinosaurs could continue to live and change and do what they do all while the rest of the province was still underwater. So it might hold some clues as to what was going on during that time. So here's kind of a, an image of what uh, North America would have looked like at the time. Uh, sort of Western North America where I'm out at uh, was its own continent uh, that we call Laramidia. And in this sort of lowland strip of land between the newly risen Rocky Mountains and the Seaway, uh, dinosaurs were very common there. And we have a very great fossil record. And this is during the, the height of that Seaway here. So Drumheller, that Badlands area is underwater, but Grand Prairie up here is sort of high and mostly dry. Uh, out where a lot of you folks are tuning in from Eastern North America was its own continent that we call Appalachia, but we don't have very many dinosaur fossils from there. So it's a bit of a mystery. And you can see how, uh, you know, the Wapiti Formation, our unit of rock here is divided into these uh, relatively poorly understood units. And the height of that Bear Paw Formation right here um, coincides with uh, about halfway along the Wapiti Formation. And that's where a lot of our dinosaur fossil sites are from. So that's very interesting to us. This is a very mysterious but important time period in the late Cretaceous of Alberta. So some sites are relatively easy to work at. This is Cluskin Hill Park, just east of Grand Prairie. And uh, it's this um, little, it's actually Canada's most northern uh, area of Badlands, even though it's, uh, you know, closer to the Yukon than it is to uh, the United States. Uh, we have things like cactuses growing up there and these really sort of arid grasslands, which is kind of an interesting ecosystem. We find very small fossils there generally, but uh, it's still a cool place. Uh, fossils are, are relatively abundant as well as all sorts of other interesting plants and animals. Uh, here's what a lot of the landscape looks like though when you get down into these uh, river valleys and creeks. So this is Pipestone Creek that flows into one of the major rivers in the area. It's not terribly far at all from my museum. And you can see it's very densely forested during the summer. Pipestone is just kind of this wash of dark greens and gray rocks and it's a little uh, monochromatic. But uh, we have these uh, late Cretaceous rock exposures here and here are some shots of uh, the bone bed, that dinosaur graveyard from the area. So a lot of it is uh, you know, digging through this sort of grayish brownish dirt and a lot of it is quite muddy as well. Um, so you get pretty dirty while you're out there but it's still pretty interesting nonetheless. Uh, here is uh, some shots along the Wapiti River. This is the waterway that Pipestone Creek drains into. And all these rock exposures that you can see along here, these are all late Cretaceous rocks. 
And uh, we're starting to figure out just how prevalent dinosaur bones are along here. It's not nearly as easy to access as the, the southern badlands. There's a lot of bushwhacking involved. Um, but uh, this exposure right here on the left, uh, one of my coworkers and I checked this out last autumn and we found, uh, didn't find any dinosaur bones, but lots of petrified wood. And then these two shots on the right here are from a, a duck billed dinosaur bone bed, which I'll talk more about later. And you can see just how high some of the hills around here get. It's pretty uh, wild country. So this is that bone bed I mentioned, and here's me there looking very, very not dorky while I'm uh, excavating a fossil. Uh, so this is a juvenile duck build dinosaur uh, bone bed. We call it the Spring Creek bone bed. Uh, lots of bones here, but not terribly many skull bones. And with certain dinosaurs like duck build dinosaurs, uh, the skull bones are really what you want to find the most because they tell you what kind of species you're working with. Uh, but it's still a pretty interesting site. We're sort of studying what was here and what happened to them. Uh, now this, what looks like a giant slot in the hill with a pile of muck at the bottom. Uh, it might look like much, but it's actually our, one of our most, if not the most interesting fossil site in the area. This is a place that we call the DC bone bed. So DC stands for dinosaur Ch chelonian, and that just means turtle. And that's sort of what we find there most often. Uh, turtles were around during the time of the dinosaurs and uh, prehistoric turtles are very interesting. And we find a lot of them as well as uh, many different types of dinosaurs at this bone bed. So a lot of our fossil sites, especially these bone beds are uh, what we call monotaxic. So that just means we generally find one type of dinosaur or animal there. This one is mixed. So we have a huge variety of small reptiles, prehistoric mammals and various dinosaurs. So this is filling in a lot of our knowledge about what this uh, extinct ecosystem was like. So here's another image of Cretaceous Alberta. Again, you can see we're in Laramidia here with this, uh, these swampy lowlands between the mountains and the sea. And uh, this is sort of prime dinosaur habitat. And here's what it would have looked like back then. So much warmer and much uh, more humid than it was today. Uh, winters were definitely less severe. Uh, we know from fossilized plants uh, like leaf impressions and petrified wood that there was lots of coniferous trees like swamp cypress, redwoods, things like that. Um, all of these Cretaceous rocks were deposited by rivers, just like this meandering river here. So we can see evidence of bends in ancient rivers, looking at cross sections in the rock, as well as these braided streams, which deposit these uh, bars of sand along their, uh, their course. And sometimes these would bury dinosaurs or other animals that died in the river. And then you would have these big flat floodplains out adjacent to these rivers that would flood in uh, wet seasons. So uh, this is kind of the ecosystem that a lot of these animals are living in. And then all these rivers are draining uh, to the east into that seaway. And you have things like marine reptiles and fish and sharks living up here and sometimes swimming a little bit up rivers. So a really interesting place. And what we're going to do is uh, take sort of a quick survey of some of the animals that we find in this ecosystem and see what we know so far, uh, including some really interesting new discoveries and what we still have yet to figure out. So uh, there was fish back then as there was today, uh, different types of fish for the most part. We have uh, a freshwater, what we call a guitar fish, which is a bit like a stingray that was called Mylodaphis. Uh, bony fish, so fish with their skeletons made out of bone instead of cartilage, include uh, things that would have looked like modern day gar fish. So uh, Cretaceous Alberta was not terribly different in some ways than places like uh, the southwestern United States along the, the southern Mississippi River down into the, you know, New Orleans bayous, that kind of thing. Uh, we have uh, relatives of modern day pike. Um, as well as this one species called uh, Esox tiameni from uh, along the Smoky River, not far from here. And it's actually the one of the world's oldest pike ever found. I don't know if there's any uh, pike fisher people out there, but uh, I have fond memories of fishing for those back in Ontario. 
Uh, then we also have mammals. So mammals are small, often warm-blooded, fuzzy creatures, uh, including humans. Uh, no humans back then, obviously, but there were different types of mammals. Most of them were pouched mammals uh, that we call marsupials. Not so much kangaroos, but things that looked a lot like uh, modern-day opossums and, and whatnot. They're a type of marsupial. And these weird rodent-like things that have this long, crazy name called multi-tuberculates, which were not rodents themselves, but they, uh, they were little gnawing mammals, which looked a lot like them. Uh, the bones of mammals are very rare because back during the time of the dinosaurs, mammals were very small, so their bones didn't fossilize very well. Usually it's the case that the bigger and sturdier an animal's bone is, the better uh, chance it stands of fossilizing. Uh, but teeth are harder than bone in most cases, and uh, in mammals, the teeth are the hardest part of their body, so that's normally what we find. And we've got some teeth from around here. And most mammals back then were either uh, small insect eating or, you know, little carnivorous type creatures. Uh, we also have a good deal of small amphibians and reptiles. So from uh, the Cluskin Hills, those, uh, those badlands we talked about earlier, we have some amphibian material, things that may have looked like uh, modern day salamanders. Uh, we have turtles from various sites, especially the DC bone bed. Um, some of which looked like uh, soft shell turtles like this one here. Some of them looked a bit like snapping turtles. And you can see on the right here, this is a skull of uh, a new type of turtle that we found in the area. Here's this V-shaped bone might look kind of like a wishbone, but it's actually a turtle's shoulder blade. Turtles have very weird internal skeletons. We also have some rare uh, crocodile material from uh, some of our sites. So there were indeed uh, things like modern day alligators and crocodiles around back then as well. And they would have looked pretty similar to modern day crocodiles and alligators. Uh, and we also had things that were similar to crocodiles, but actually not. Uh, so this is a, a Champsosaurus. And although it's got this long toothy snout and uh, was built for swimming. Uh, Champsosaurs were kind of their own group on the reptile family tree. We don't actually know who their closest uh, relatives were, but uh, they're still uh, interesting nonetheless, and they were quite common in Cretaceous Alberta, including up here. We also have uh, some different lizard species. So we have one called Cluskinsaurus grand prairiensis, which might not be the most imaginative name in the world, but it leaves no secrets as to where it was found. So it would have looked a bit like a modern day skink. And then we have uh, these things that are called monster saurian lizards, which uh, sounds pretty cool. And one from the, the DC bone bed, which might be uh, a species of a very large prehistoric lizard called Paleosaniwa. We're still working on figuring, figuring it out exactly uh, what it was. But uh, Paleosaniwa was about the size of a modern day Komodo dragon, which is uh, the largest living lizard today and uh, is certainly a quite dangerous species. So uh, dinosaurs weren't the only hazardous animals around back then. Uh, so here's some Champsosaur backbones. They have this uh, sort of characteristic hourglass shape in the, the top middle there where the spine at the top breaks off and uh, a little Champsosaur bone right down here as well. So the presence of all these uh, small reptiles and amphibians and whatnot helps to reinforce the fact that this area was seasonally warm, um, quite a temperate climate and had lots of freshwater habitats. So here's that little Cluskinsaurus skull. You can see that's where the eye socket would be and it has all these little tiny teeth. And then this is the a skull bone from this uh, lizard from the DC bone bed. And you can see on the right here where it would have fit onto the skull of the, uh, the lizard in full. We also have plesiosaurs. So some of you might be familiar with plesiosaurs. These are uh, marine reptiles, um, you know, kind of your, your Loch Ness monster type looking things. Here's a full skeleton hanging at the uh, University of Alberta. Uh, this specimen we found uh, near Peace River, which is a couple hours north of where I am. And uh, these slots in this rock here, so this is just a block of rock, these slots here are where the vertebrae, the backbones, just around here of the plesiosaur used to be, but they eroded away, but left an impression in the, uh, the rock 
which used to be a sandy bottom of a, a seaway. And then these bones here, which kind of run crisscross along where the backbones used to be, uh, are these bones right here. These are called um, gastralia. And uh, they're also sort of informally called belly ribs. And these would sort of stiffen the whole torso of the plesiosaur, almost giving it something like an internal shell, which is good for bracing yourself as you paddle through the water. We also had these big, uh, interesting giant lizards called mosasaurs. So dinosaurs, although the word dinosaur means uh, terrible lizard, uh, dinosaurs are not true lizards. They're kind of their own branch of the, the reptile family tree as well. But mosasaurs were actually proper lizards, even though some of them got to be about the size of whales. And uh, some people think they may be close relatives of modern day snakes. The uh, joints in the mosasaur skull uh, work a lot like the joints in the skull of a snake, uh, which is how snakes are able to um, swallow things larger than their own heads. And their uh, limbs evolved into flippers, uh, generally for steering in the water. And then they had these big sort of uh, dorsal flukes on top of their tails for paddling. Uh, Mosasaur material from the area is not uh, terribly common, although in some uh, slightly older rock back from when this area was underwater, we've got some Mosasaur uh, material. Now getting into dinosaurs, uh, one of the most common types of dinosaurs found anywhere in Alberta are the hadrosaurs. So these are the duck-billed dinosaurs, uh, which were big, generally four-legged plant eaters. So very common medium to large herbivores. And we have uh, bones, uh, teeth, and even impressions of dinosaur skin from all over this area. Uh, the uh, Kluskin Hill Badlands, some people have theorized it might have been a possible nesting ground for hadrosaurs, whoops, because uh, we have found really tiny uh, duck-billed dinosaur bones there. No eggs so far, so uh, it's kind of still up in the air. And we also have footprints from uh, the area. Uh, one of the best places is along the Red Willow River, which is a little bit west of uh, the Grand Prairie area. So duck-billed dinosaurs tend to come in two major varieties. We have ones that have uh, either a solid crest or no crest at all made of bone on the top of their skull, like this said Montosaurus here. Or we have ones that had these hollow bony crests on their skull. So this is a Hypacrosaurus, and uh, this crest on top of its head was full of these hollow tubes to help it make noise, and probably was useful for showing off as well. Now this image here is the inside of a, a hadrosaur jawbone and all these little shapes here, these leaf shaped uh, things are their teeth. So the grinding surface was just at the top here, but uh, they would wear down their teeth as they chewed and they could always grow new teeth in to replace the old ones. So one of the most common ones is called Edmontosaurus, which is found uh, throughout North America, all the way from Alaska down to uh, you know, the Western United States. So a very common uh, duck-billed dinosaur. And here's a, a probable footprint of Edmontosaurus uh, from uh, our area. Here's its skull. Now you can see looking at it that the skull doesn't have any bony crest on its head. It just has uh, a flat head. But this very interesting uh, specimen was found a few years ago. And here's what we're looking at. These uh, parts right here, these sort of long dark shapes are uh, the bones from the back of the skull. And then the bottom arrow is pointing to, it's essentially uh, kind of like fossilized skin. So these are skin impressions from the back of the dinosaur's neck. And you can see it had these big, large uh, clusters of scales, this wrinkly texture in uh, the back of its neck. And it did indeed have scales covering its body, very small scales. And then the top arrow is pointing to uh, a fossilized soft crest that would have been on top of the dinosaur's head. Now we've known about Edmontosaurus for over a hundred years, but we didn't know that it had this um, fleshy crest on the top of its head, which would have looked a lot like the, the comb of a rooster or a chicken. Uh, and that's because the soft tissue remains of prehistoric animals very rarely fossilized, but we are very lucky in this case that it did. So you can see on the right here is uh, kind of a, a good uh, idea as to what this animal actually looked like. So very valuable find 
uh, coming out of this area. And uh, if you ever are up in the area and can visit the museum, you can see this specimen on display. It's pretty amazing. This is one we found in the summer of 2019. I uh, played a small role in helping to recover this specimen, which was um, found a little to the southwest of the museum. Uh, it's this big block of rock and these uh, bones you're looking at here are the underside of a, a, probably an Edmontosaurus's vertebrae from near the base of the tail. This V-shaped bone down at the bottom is called a chevron, and uh, it's one of these bones that stick down from the bottom of the tail. So this block just tumbled off of uh, a riverbank, and we were able to figure out that it had bones in it and uh, collected it. And uh, hopefully the uh, rest of the skeleton is still out there somewhere, and we're hoping to be able to go back and uh, collect the rest of it. Now, this is a really sad one. This is also a duck-billed dinosaur, again, probably an Edmontosaurus. Uh, this one was found in 2012, and it, at the time, was very complete. Um, for all the dinosaurs that we found in this area, it's not terribly common yet to find a relatively complete skeleton where all the bones are more or less in the position they were when the dinosaur died, so definitely a very good find. But uh, this dinosaur couldn't be uh, uncovered and, and protected and dug up and brought back to the museum all in one day. Now it was way out in uh, the bush. And so the paleontologists who found it realized they couldn't uh, take it all back with them that day. So they covered it up and uh, hid it very well. And we're planning to come back early the next day and uh, you know dig up the full specimen and bring it back. But when they arrived, they found that uh, some unknown people in the night had come along and uh, either tried to steal the, the skeleton or just wanted to destroy it. But most of the bones were destroyed and were not able to be recovered. Uh, so most of the skeleton was lost and this is most of what we were able to recover. So this was a very, very uh, sad and unfortunate uh, instance here and uh, just kind of goes to show you that uh, you know even in uh, places like Alberta we're still having to deal with fossil poaching and vandalism which is definitely illegal um, and unfortunately the culprits were never caught so this is kind of a, a sad reminder of what could have been. Uh, kind of on happier news though, uh, we're uh, getting some work done on the Spring Creek dinosaur bone bed. So uh, one of our collaborators in uh, Australia is doing some uh, work on that particular site. And what we think we're dealing with here is some kind of crested duckbill. Um, we're actually looking at uh, juveniles here though. So kind of like teenaged animals that uh, were kind of out on their own for some reason. And here's some of the better bones from the site, but they're all what we call disarticulated. They're not all together in you know sort of one unit. So we're still trying to figure out what exactly the species is, but it probably looked something kind of like this. Now, this is definitely one of our best and most interesting specimens. This is kind of uh, nicknamed the baby. And uh, this specimen came from the DC bone bed back, I believe, in 2017. And it is a, a young crested duckbill dinosaur. Uh, it's a complete skull, uh, which was very nicely recovered. And, uh, you know, this is what it looks like. Uh, unfortunately, because it's not fully grown, we can't exactly tell what species it is. It has some traits um, of uh, certain dinosaurs that we know about, um, but it's kind of a, a mixed bag. We're not exactly sure what it could be. It could be something new or uh, something we've already discovered. Uh, but it would have looked something like these dinosaurs here, like Corythosaurus or Hypacrosaurus in the middle, or Lambiosaurus, but it comes from this growth stage that isn't terribly well represented. And as you can see, dinosaur skulls changed a lot as they grew. So uh, it's tricky to figure it out, but that's definitely one of our, our best and uh, favorite specimens so far. And we're working on getting it described. Uh, another really interesting find, a little bit more recent, was this uh, skull that was found uh, in the river near the mouth of Pipestone Creek uh, a couple years ago. And it was this big block that had these uh, bones. You can see these, these bones sticking out of the, the block here. Uh, so that was collected. 
And when it was brought back to the lab and worked on, we realized that it was this uh, mostly complete skull. You can see the, the eye right there and the jaw, the teeth are even still in position and it has a big bony crest. So this is an amazing specimen of a very rare species of uh, a dinosaur called Lambiosaurus. So this is a very, very interesting find for this area and for paleontology in general. And so this is being worked on as well. So as you can see from the uh, more well-studied uh, rock formations in Alberta, we have a great variety of duckbill dinosaurs in the Wapiti formation here. We're still kind of filling in the blanks. There's still lots of discoveries to be made. Uh, now this is sort of our flagship dinosaur. This is a horned dinosaur or a ceratopsian called Pachyrhinosaurus. And uh, there's a few types of Pachyrhinosaurus, but uh, the one that we find at the Pipestone Creek dinosaur bone bed here, you can see these are all fossils from this dinosaur. It's super dense. This one is called Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae, named after Al Lacusta who discovered it. We have a second bone bed as well from further west along the Wapiti River, which might be uh, a species that uh, has been known about for longer called Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis. Now, uh, finding them in these big uh, multi-animal bone beds tells us that they were probably a herding animal. And on occasion, these herds were sort of wiped out in these catastrophic uh, you know, uh, climate disasters, uh, you know, due to floods, maybe trying to cross a treacherous river or something. And unfortunately, most of the individuals would have died and been buried at the same place at the same time. So here's some uh, glamour shots of uh, the Pipestone Creek bone bed. And you can see just how dense and, uh, and just amazing this bone bed is. It's uh, really quite something. There was you know, estimated to be hundreds, if not thousands of Pachyrhinosauruses here. And as you can see on the left, um, it's a lot of uh, very muddy, muddy work. Um, there's been a, a famous sort of publication on working on fossils in Grand Prairie uh, by a member of the Royal Terrell Museum. And it was titled Mosquitoes and Mud because that's generally what you're gonna find in here. Uh, so there's uh, definitely a few different types of Pachyrhinosaurus. Uh, we have this uh, specimen at the upper right here, the Dinosaur Park Pachyrhinosaur. We don't really know exactly what it is. Uh, from uh, the Wapiti Formation, a little bit younger than that, we've got our Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae, which uh, you can always tell because it has these three spikes in the middle of its head here. Sometimes it's just one spike, sometimes it's up to three. And then uh, from the, the Drumheller Badlands areas, from the Horseshoe Canyon formation, we have Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis, um, which may also be present in the upper part of the Wapiti from the uh, Wapiti River bone bed, but we're not too sure. Uh, and there's another species from uh, Alaska as well called Pachyrhinosaurus paratorum. So if these were all one species from all the same, uh, all at the same time, we might think that uh, Pachyrhinosaurus was perhaps migrating between um, Southern Alberta and Alaska, but these are all different types from different uh, parts of the Cretaceous. So working out their evolution and their distribution is uh, you know, kind of a challenge right now. But here's what it would have looked like. Uh, so Pachyrhinosaurus um, used to be a relatively obscure dinosaur, but thanks to the, the Pipestone Creek bone bed, um, it's become quite better known. Here you can see a reconstruction of uh, them trying to cross this wide flooded river and not everybody's going to make it. And then the Royal Terrell Museum has a whole herd of them in statue form uh, done by the fabulous Brian Cooley. And uh, yeah, so it, it's pretty cool to see uh, this local dinosaur uh, has made it so far and wide and been seen by so many people. Uh, next, we're going to get into carnivores. So these are uh, called theropods. These are mostly two-legged, generally uh, meat-eating uh, dinosaurs. Um, they're relatively rare for this area. Now, carniv carnivorous dinosaurs are almost never the most common dinosaur found in uh, their respective rock formation. Uh, but around here, uh, we're having a hard time finding uh, carnivorous dinosaur bones, but uh, their teeth and their footprints are uh, definitely known from the area. So they definitely were around here. And we even have evidence of them scavenging at some of these plant eating dinosaur bone beds because they occasionally lost their teeth in the process. 
so hopefully we'll find more skeletal material, but on the, the right here, you can see this is a Tyrannosaur footprint, probably from a species called Albertosaurus found in the area. So Tyrannosaurs were the largest uh, predators of uh, Western North America at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, and there's been a few species known from Alberta, but uh, we only have teeth so far, so we can't identify it down to the, uh, the name specifically. We might have a new species up here, or it might be something that we know about uh, from southern Alberta, particularly animals like Gorgosaurus, which you can see here and also behind me, um, or its close relative Albertosaurus from uh, slightly younger rocks. Uh, here's a Tyrannosaur tooth I found in the area, which actually isn't all that big. This is just kind of the tip, but this was a pretty exciting find. So it's cool to know that I'm living in an area where Tyrannosaurs once existed. And here's a couple of uh, statues of uh, Alberta Tyrannosaurs from the Royal Tyrell Museum. So we might be looking at one or the other or both or neither of these species around here. We need more bones to tell for sure. So uh, here's our distribution of Tyrannosaurs in the area. We've got things like Gorgosaurus and Dasclidosaurus from these slightly older rocks in central and southern Alberta. Obviously nothing in the bear paw, but uh, you know, from the Wapiti formation, we've got some kind of Tyrannosaur based on the teeth. And then from higher up, we may be looking at Albertosaurus, uh, which is you know, known from the Drumheller area as well as from uh, around Edmonton even. And then at the, the top of the Cretaceous, near the very end of the age of dinosaurs, we do have a couple specimens of Tyrannosaurus itself from Alberta, which is pretty neat. Uh, there's some other cool stuff from around here. This is called a Canignathid, which uh, some people might have heard of the dinosaur Oviraptor from Mongolia. These are distant relatives of that. So they looked a bit like a modern day cassowary bird. Uh, they had these toothless beaks and here's a beak that we found from the DC bone bed. Uh, we also think we might have some other bones as well. And these would have been uh, feathered uh, uh, dinosaurs um, walking around sort of nipping on plants and uh, seeds, maybe things like that. Uh, so they're, they're not terribly common either, but uh, they're really cool and it's quite special to find one. Uh, then we get into the dromaeosaurs. So these are the raptors, as we often call them. You may be uh, familiar with Velociraptor from uh, dinosaur, um, Jurassic Park. Um, so that uh, belongs to the, the dromaeosaur family. Uh, we have one species from around here called Boreonychus. Uh, this is a skull bone of a, a Boreonychus found at Pipestone Creek. And it's only ever been found around here. And we don't have terribly many bones, but we've uh, got some teeth like this one here. So this is seen through a microscope. So this tooth is really, really small, but you can see the serrations on the edge of the tooth where they're exposed here. So they would have had pretty wickedly sharp teeth and, and nasty bites. Uh, so we've got a few different types of uh, dromaeosaurs from Alberta as well. Uh, quite a few from the old man and dinosaur park formations. We have one called Atrociraptor from younger in the Cretaceous. We've got our Boreonychus up here. It would be nice to find more species as well, but uh, hey, you know, we can only ask for so much. Then there is also the Troodontids, which were close relatives of uh, dromaeosaurs. A little bit different though, they had really, really big eyes. So some people think they may have been nocturnal. Um, these were kind of bird sized to uh, almost human sized dinosaurs. And they had really large brains. Um, now not anywhere near a human brain, obviously, but uh, the brain to body size ratio was comparable to modern day birds. So uh, they were among the most intelligent dinosaurs, but they weren't really rivaling primates in their intelligence. They would have been about as smart as a modern day chicken. And uh, just like the, the dromaeosaurs, the raptors, these also would have had a coat of feathers. They're very closely related to birds. And uh, this is what their teeth looked like. So they had these large teeth with these big, what we call denticles on them, these serrations. And uh, yeah, we've got a few you know, isolated teeth from the area, but we don't so far have any published troodontid bones and troodontids are quite uh, rare and obscure in Alberta. You can see we've only got a handful of um, known species. So finding more of those would be pretty exciting. So to kind of uh, summarize um, this whole thing, 
Um, Northwestern Alberta definitely has some untapped potential for uh, knowledge and research in prehistoric life. And, uh, you know, we've only just scratched the surface. The abundance may even rival the famous Alberta Badlands for, uh, you know, number of fossils and types of dinosaurs, but we've still got a lot of uh, work to do. So it's just a really hard and time consuming process, but, uh, you know, we're, we're working hard at it. So uh, thank you for uh, attending the talk and uh, hopefully everybody found that uh, interesting and informative. And if you're ever up in Northwestern Alberta, please pay us a visit. Nicholas, thank you so much for sharing your passion and knowledge with us. Um, I just wanted to encourage everyone, if you do have any questions for Nicholas, we do have some time to take those now. So please feel free to share them in the chat box on the YouTube stream. Um, I have a couple questions for you. So I was gonna ask those now. I was gonna ask, um, how has like COVID-19 impacted any of the research happening in your area? Well, uh, you know, it's been, hasn't been easy for anybody really. Um, we were able to get out and do some field work uh, last year. It was mostly at Pipestone. So we recovered uh, some more Pachyrhinosaurus stuff from there. Um, kind of the problem was uh, in a normal summer, we would have uh, collaborators coming up from Edmonton. Uh, so our head curator is actually based out of the University of Alberta there. And so they would bring up technicians and uh, grad students. And we have other collaborators from Australia with their students who would come over. And um, we even have some folks from Italy working with us as well. Um, obviously nobody could travel last year. <laughs> uh, and even people in Edmonton uh, just had to stay in Edmonton. So there wasn't much um, as far as field work and research happening last year, but that's just kind of how it goes. Um, we'll see what this summer looks like. You know, it's really hard to um, sort of plan out exactly what's gonna happen. But uh, I'm hoping that we'll have uh, the time and opportunity to get back out there. Yeah, definitely. Um, what has been your favorite find in Northwestern Alberta? Uh, that is tough to say. Uh, a lot of, you know, paleontologists say, you know, their favorite fossil was the last one they found. Or the last <laughs> one they found. Um, so I don't know if I really have a, a favorite one. Um, I myself haven't found anything uh, particularly interesting. Uh, the most sort of um, groundbreaking discovery I've ever made was a new spot to find fish scales in uh, the Kluskin Hills. So, uh, you know, not, not terribly groundbreaking all the same. But I would have to say, I guess, uh, what I think maybe the coolest specimen we found was the crested Edmontosaurus we talked about earlier. That one is uh, sort of once in a lifetime. Very cool. Um, what is your favorite dinosaur? So my favorite dinosaur is actually Triceratops, which we don't find around here. Uh, there's uh, some Triceratopses known from Southern Alberta. Um, but yeah, that's always been my favorite. Okay, cool. I, yeah, Triceratops is probably one of my favorites as well. Um, I guess just to conclude, do you want to, what is happening at the Philip J. Curry Museum right now and how can people stay connected with the museum virtually? Well, we are doing a lot of stuff uh, online. Um, we've got some things coming up. Uh, we do regular uh, a guest lecture series um, every month on YouTube. So you can check out our YouTube uh, account for that. Uh, we have one uh, coming up uh, pretty soon with um, uh, Greg Funston, who is a paleontologist uh, originally from Al Al Alberta, but now based out of uh, Scotland. And he's talking about baby tyrannosaurs, which will be pretty cool. Um, we also are doing in April a uh, sort of, it's kind of like a fantasy dinosaur social media tournament uh, called Ar Archosaur April Absurdity that I'm sort of overseeing. So we're writing and posting sort of imaginary matches uh, for dinosaurs all throughout the uh, month of April. And we are in the middle of planning uh, a science festival for sometime this spring or this summer. And we offer uh, summer camps and um, in-person tours of uh, the bone bed at Pipestone Creek as well. So, you know, things online, things to do in person. So we're, we're doing everything we can given the circumstances. Definitely. That sounds all very exciting. So thank you again, Nicholas, and thank you to those that joined us virtually today. 
Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, Dinosaurs, the Age of Big Weird Feathered Things in Sonica the Sound Experience will open to the public on April 9th, Friday, April 9th. And then once again, those that are 55 and better will get free admission to the museum on Fridays. If you are interested in learning more about the museum, please consider signing up for our newsletter on our website so that you can stay up to date on all things that are happening, upcoming announcements, new exhibitions, and all the fun things that we have going on both hopefully soon in person and virtually. Um, there will be no 55 and better programming on Friday, April 2nd, as it is Good Friday, but please consider joining us on Friday, April 16th. We will be having a workshop called From Behind the Mask. It's a quilt making mask workshop. And as it's spring break, we are encouraging those that have grandchildren to have them participate along with you. So thank you again for joining us today and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.